You're listening to Inspirational Perspective with Linnell Harris on 1690, the talk of Chicago. Good morning, Chicago. You're listening to Inspirational Perspective. I'm your host, Linnell Harris, your very own life coach right here on WVON 1690 AM, the talk of Chicago. Inspirational Perspective on your radio is all about murdering mediocrity and living the best life possible. So as I ask you every Sunday morning, are you living the best life possible and this is the place to be to explore that possibility well happy sunday everyone august 23rd and uh in particular on a personal level one day after my 44th birthday and uh man i'm grateful i'm I'm grateful for life i'm grateful to be here another year i'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, live one more year or another way to say it is to rotate around the sun one more time um but either way uh it's it's always exciting to celebrate a birthday and um more than anything i'm excited about uh just the opportunity to continue to celebrate um, life and and uh, what's next in what's next in life. Um, it's interesting because yesterday, when I woke up, I was thinking about uh, my birthday and um, my wife. She was gracious. She let me just kind of lay there for a while with no distractions, and so just kind of sitting there thinking about 44 years and in my, my mind went back to 22 years i was like man okay so 44 divided by two when i was 22 i had lived at that point half of my life and so i just started thinking about my life at the age of 22 and where i was in life and many ways who i was around what I was doing. And the thing that began to come to mind for me was this whole notion of purpose. Man, thank God for purpose because of how it changed my life. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, But man, I got to thank you all. Many of you all reached out to me via social media, different platforms, just to say happy birthday. And uh, wow, thank you. I was blown away by the love, by the acknowledgement. And so just thank you all so much um, for the continued love and support. But more than anything, the birthday wishes that you all shared yesterday that that made yesterday what it was. I had a phenomenal day, phenomenal weekend, uh, spending time with the people I love and the people I care about. Most importantly, my wife and uh, my family. And um, I also want to acknowledge my mother. You know, I, I um, when I, after witnessing the birth of my own son and, you know, just the miracle that birth is, I often, uh, when, when I think about my birthday, I can't, I can't think about my birthday just on my own. I mean, my mother is really the impetus for me being here 
and her sacrifice, nine months. Nine months of sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice on the birthday um, in terms of the pain that she endured to bring me into the world. And so I just want to acknowledge her, but also for the love, care, and nurture um, throughout those years, those for, for, formidable years where there's nothing we can do for ourselves. I look at my son, he's three years old, and um, at three, he can now likely survive without my wife and I um, in terms of if that's all he had, right? He can now likely survive maybe a few days because he would know how to forage for food in the house and things like that. But man, when you think about how helpless we are as infants and the role that our parents or our caretakers or guardians play, man, just incredibly grateful. But not just that, but also the teaching. I was sharing yesterday about my son. My wife and I, we were walking through the mall and a gentleman, he had two boys. They were twins, four years old. And uh, we were just walking through the mall and I saw them. They were matching. I'm like, oh, man, look at them with the, the matching Nikes on, the matching shirt. He's like, yeah, they're twins. They're, they're you know, they're paternal. They're, they're not, you know, uh, identical, but they, you know, they're they're twins. And I said, oh, OK. And um, well, I think it's fraternal. Can't remember which one. Anyway. But uh, so I'm like, wow. He was like, yeah, man, they grow up so fast. I'm like, man, who are you telling? And he was like, they got these little personalities and these wants and demands. And I just started laughing. I was like, yeah, we, we're just now beginning to experience that because my son at three years old has become incredibly demanding. <laughs> and uh, last night having dinner with family, I... Uh, it's funny, man. We were talking about children, and we, my wife and I, we were talking about Legend in particular and his demands and like some of the things he's doing. Like he's really trying to exercise in many ways his his will, his autonomy, and and how he does it. Right? Like, no, Daddy. He's like, whoa, wait a second. You don't talk to Daddy like that. And so, anyway, bringing it back to my own birthday and the role my parents played. In my overall development, I want to acknowledge them um, and then acknowledge my wife for making sure that I had a fantastic day, fantastic birthday. And again, each and every one of you all that reached out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, now, I can't I can't start this show. I want to talk about self-discipline today, you guys. And, and by the way, I went back and forth about this topic, right? Because I'm like, it's my birthday. I just want to relax. I, I just want to chill. One, one part of me was like, oh, just take phone calls and make it an easy show. You know, just. And, uh, and then I woke up early this morning like, no. How, how are you going to set up a topic for self-discipline and then continually put it off? <laughs> we got to do self-discipline. Um, and so... I'm excited about the topic. And, and of course, I always love hearing from you guys, from you guys so that doesn't stop that from happening. 773-591-1690. But I, I got to start by at least yeah, doing some reflection. Because yesterday when I, I woke up and I was reflecting, when I was 22 years old, here's what came to mind. It was 1998. And 1998 was... That was a very tough time for me, an incredibly tough time for me. I was lost in many ways. Uh, I had no clear direction, none. When I say lost, I was, I was completely lost. And I, I, um, I had no purpose, most importantly. As a matter of fact, I didn't, I didn't know my purpose. And I started thinking about my friends at the time, the things I was doing. I, was, I even went back all the way like, man, who was I dating? Like all the different things that, that, that I was experiencing at the age of 22. And I even remember then, like in, in terms of my dating life, I was disappointed. I was just disappointed 
across the board with my life at such an early point in life. And um, more than anything, just trying to figure it all out. I, I came up in uh, uh, fairly, I'm not going to say rigid, but rigid in some ways, uh, rigid religious structure. And so there were a lot of do's and don'ts and this is how you should live your life and this is what you should do and you shouldn't do that. And you shouldn't do this. And I've always been curious. And so I was like, but why? You know, why? Why? You know, why can't you do this? And why shouldn't you do that? And and, and what does all this really mean? And so I was just full of questions, just full of questions. And when I was thinking about the topic of self-discipline this morning, one of the things that came to my life is how discipline and I'm going to break down the three aspects of discipline. And we're going to talk a lot about how to develop discipline. And I, I really want to make this as when you talk about discipline, people get scared, man. Because it's like, oh, you know, like it's this, this really difficult, like self-discipline plan is so difficult. And I, I want to talk about that, too. Like what why we in many ways interpret this concept of self-discipline as as something that's incredibly difficult. But. What was present for me in terms of, you know, my life at 22 was. The areas of discipline that I practice and just small little areas have created so much growth and potential now. And, and let me give you an example of what I mean. Those of you who've taken the purpose course, I typically open the purpose course telling the story. And um, I was introduced to a mentor at the age of 22. And uh, this mentor was downtown, CEO of a, a publishing company. And, and, and so I, I remember having, like, kind of getting things correlated and set up where I would take, well, meet them downtown and, and, and they would, you know, begin this process of mentorship. And I remember the first time I went, it was a, a 90 minute commute via public transportation. I didn't have a car at the time. I was living in my parents' basement, um, fairly broke, <laughs> say fairly broke. I mean, I did have a little bit because I wasn't paying rent so I could hold on to a few dollars. And so I took this ride downtown, lived on the west, west, west suburbs of Chicago. So I had to take the number 17 bus to the Des Plaines L, the Des Plaines L all the way down to the red line. Get off. And by the way, you know, I have to get off, make the transition to the red line, red line downtown, one bus, and then I finally got to this office. And I remember when I got to the office, I don't, I don't know why, it's not like I had a lot to do, but I was anxious. I mean, 22 years old and you know, a lot of times we just want to we want to be or we want to be kind of doing what we want to do, even if we're not clear about what that is. It's like, I just want to be doing what I want to do. And I remember I was anxious. I was sitting there. You would think I was like, a, you know, a mature businessman that had places to go, because I remember being like, man, what's taking so long for us to have this meeting and sitting there? And finally, I'm, I'm pulled into the meeting and I remember how the meeting went just really a hey look i i accepted this i'm not sure about it is what my mentor was saying to me i'm not sure about it but i'm willing to give you a shot first thing i want you to do is i want you to read a book i want you to give me a, a report a synopsis of what it is that you read so here's what you're going to do you're going to read the, the first three chapters of think and grow rich and you're going to write a synopsis on what you learned from those chapters we'll meet again in one month and I'll see you then. And that, that was the meeting. And I remember walking out of that meeting livid. I mean, I was just like, I can't believe I just came all the way downtown. 90 minute ride, right? To sit with somebody who could basically call me and tell me what they wanted to tell me. Like, dude, if you want me to write a book, you should have just told me that on the phone. And I, I didn't understand 
that at the time my mentor was looking for a certain level of dedication, commitment, and discipline. Are you willing to show up? I, di I didn't get that at the time. I just, you know, I wanted it to be my way. And I remember walking out really upset. I called my mentor some bad names walking down the street. As a matter of fact, the people were walking past me, they probably thought I had, you know, Tourette's because they like, man, you know, I was just really upset. Um, and part of, part of me being upset had everything to do with the space I was living in. I was disappointed. I had let myself down. I had get, got kicked out of college. Um, I was lying to my friends about what I was doing. Um, telling them I was going to school when really what I was doing is just trying to find a job and hold a job. Um, at the time, I had recently gotten fired from a fairly decent job in a warehouse because I couldn't get there on time. We're talking about discipline, right? I mean, all this, the element of discipline was just missing from my life. I wanted, I, I, I wanted more, but I really didn't know how to get it. It's completely lost. I remember riding back home on the train, just kind of like, this is pointless. And somewhere between that meeting and the next, it just kind of hit me like, well, he's successful. And, and if I want to be successful, maybe I should just take this on. So I went and I got... And by the way, you know, back then there was no Amazon, right? It's no like just, you know, boop, boop, boop. And the book shows up. Like I had to, again, no car. I think I probably borrowed my parents' car and drove to the bookstore and picked up the book. And I didn't even talk to them about this, right? I was just, you know, I'm just going to do this. And I read the first three chapters. Wrote a synopsis. And I went back. And I remember showing up in my mentor's office the next month with this synopsis. And again, I'm 22 years old. And I remember showing up in my mentor's office with this synopsis and, and being proud in many ways. I had it in a little manila, you know, file folder. And, uh, you know, i am got my synopsis and, you know, I'm, I'm dressed as, as best I can, as I can dress and I'm waiting there and I'm anxious again because I just, you know, I want to prove like, hey, I'm, I'm worth the time in many ways. And so I remember finally getting called into his office and it's like, so how'd it go? And I'm like, well, I read the, I read the, I read the first three chapters. So, like, okay, great. Um, what's your purpose? Huh? What do you mean? And so I hand my synopsis to him and he opens the middle of the folder and he looks at it and he puts it back on the desk and he looks at me and says, what's, what's your purpose? Well, I, um, I don't know. He said, well, didn't the, didn't the book in the first chapter ask you to distinguish, distinguish your definite purpose? And I said, yeah, well, yeah, it did. I, I, I mean, I didn't know you wanted me to, to do everything that the book told me to do. I mean, you wanted a synopsis of the first three chapters. That, that's what I gave you here. And this is where I, I learned one of my biggest lessons. He said, young man. Say reading isn't about the ability to recognize words on a page and regurgitate them. He said reading is about comprehension. And comprehension requires that you apply the knowledge because you can't fully understand something until you actually apply the knowledge. That's when you know if you have a level of understanding. So he broke down what reading was to me he said, now, what I want you to do, as he took my synopsis and he just folded, he folded into like a half and then he folded into another half where it was big enough to fit into his hand. And he just crumbled it. <laughs> and while he's looking at me, just kind of took it and tossed it in his trash behind his desk and said, what I want you to do is I want you to go back and really read the first three chapters. And when I see you again, you should know your purpose. Now, if you, if you thought I was mad the first time I went to his office, oh, you know, I was steaming the second time. Steaming. 
so I remember walking out of there like, man, this dude will never see me again. Like, who does he think he like, man, I, ain't nobody going to treat me like that. What I didn't realize is I was triggered. I was triggered because he saw me. He saw he saw how I thought and he pointed it out directly to me. And at the same time, he was teaching me. And so I did the work. I went back. I read that first chapter where Napoleon Hill talks about the definite definiteness of purpose. And that's when I pinned my purpose. I just wrote it down. I, I, I came from my heart. I remember reading it and I just thought to myself, what is it that you want to do? My mother can attest to the question of career, the question of what I wanted to do with my life and, and how, I, how much I struggled with that from, from, from a teenager all the way into my early 20s. In that day, what I wrote down was what you hear me say in many ways on the air when I come on, that I wanted to help myself and others live the best life possible. Now, there's a few other things to my purpose, a few other things that I say to my purpose in terms of the leader I intend to be, the speaker I intend to be, and who it is that I intend to teach, and, you know, people all over the world. Um, but the, the true crux, the true essence of my purpose is to help myself and others live the best life possible possible i wrote those words after meeting with him and that changed my life changed my life 22 years old <laughs> makes me emotional really more than anything grateful this week i had the opportunity to talk to a young man um 22 friend of mine who I grew up with reached out to me, man, multiple times um, via text to say, hey, Linnell, this, this young man really needs some support. Can you support him? Can you support him? Can you have a conversation with him? And so we finally got a chance to have a conversation this week. And uh, I just think about how things work full circle. Because right as I speak, he's 22. He's 22 years old. So I pray God that I can have the impact on this young man's life that my mentor, who wasn't a mentor for a long time, but was very, very specific, very detailed about how I should think about life, the impact that he had on mine. And so I'm, I'm grateful this morning. When I, when I think about 44 years of life, when I think about where I was at the half point in my life at this point, I'm just, I'm really grateful. All right. Well, I, I wanted to share that just so how, I mean, in many ways, how all of us are where we are is because of someone else and many, many people, the words they said to us, the the directions they gave us, um, the kind word they gave us. Sometimes just the smile that a stranger gave is the makes the impact in our lives. And um, I'm just incredibly grateful this morning. So that man changed my life. All right. Let's talk about some self-discipline. <clears throat> Before I start tearing up, man. Hey, I've, I've become a softie. <laughs> I think the more I start to realize how dynamic life is, man. It's just, whew. Um, I'm just grateful. All right. Self-discipline. Self-discipline. Let's, let's, let's get into this. Now, discipline is a tough nut to crack. And I promise you, I, I'm going to take my time today. If you have questions, give me a phone call, 773-591-1690. These are the things I've learned. Yesterday, my wife gave me a photo shoot. One of the photos I asked the, the photographer to take is me doing a handstand. And um, I, was just, I was just in a, you know, one of those moves. And he was like, man, how old are you? 
And let me tell you something. One of the reasons why I can function the way I function physically is an element of discipline. But I want to talk about what discipline is and how discipline works and how it's worked in my life in particular, but also what I've learned from many other people that have helped me develop discipline. Because I think in many ways, when, when you think about discipline, we got it. I mean, we kind of got it all wrong. And I, I really want to, in some ways, look at this in a way that you probably haven't necessarily heard someone talk about discipline before. So first and foremost, I want you to write this down. You, know, you guys know by now, if you're listening to me and maybe if you're driving or something, you want to come back and you want to you want to listen to this again. But I want you to write this down if you're listening right now. The biggest hurdle to my success is me. Whoa. You know, Linnell, I know that. But somebody doesn't. <laughs> somebody right now, they're in a place of being a victim and they're, you know, they're they're like, no, that's not it. It's something else. It's someone else. It's. It's uh, the society, it's the way the society works, it's because of where I was born, it's because of where I am. You just don't understand, Linnell. No, the biggest hurdle to your success is you. My, the biggest hurdle to my own success, all the things that I want to do, is me. And the most successful people I know are also the most disciplined people. And by the way, they're not always disciplined in every aspect of life. We always have weaknesses. I'm going to talk about that. But they're disciplined in the places of life that matter most to them. Um, these are the kind of people that don't let their celebrations outshine their wins. It's interesting. Yesterday we, we were at the mall. And, uh, man, the last few times I've been at the mall, something I noticed is the most expensive stores have the longest lines. Louis Vuitton, long line. Gucci, long line. And I always ask myself, right? Because when you think about a luxury brand, one, either there's two things that are happening. One, either you're incredibly wealthy or two, you know, in my mind, you had a phenomenal win that you're rewarding yourself for. So when I see these people online, I'm like, I wonder, is this a reward? You know, you're spending, man, yesterday we were talking at, at, at dinner, they were saying that a Louis Vuitton sweater costs twenty six, twenty seven hundred dollars a sweater cost twenty seven hundred dollars i couldn't imagine i mean i just i can't in my mind it's like man what what how would my portfolio change somebody gave me three grand well let's buy these stock let's do this let's you know but you know twenty seven hundred dollars but here's the thing you know when you're disciplined and you have systems in place maybe it's a reward so i always ask myself like what did they do that is allowing them to celebrate like this right i'm being facetious y'all but you know you know, look at this line. Look at all these winners in line that are celebrating. <laughs> but that's not the case. Many of us, we, we're not necessarily celebrating. We're just exercising a lack of discipline in our finances, in our money, in our decision making. Successful people tend to their well-being through every avenue that's available to them. And successful people also know how to control their energy source with intentional rest. And as always, the biggest hurdle to my success is me. The toughest person I've ever had to lead is me. Therefore, my energy is placed. The thing, I want you to write this one down too. My energy should be placed in the discipline of me. So I'm going to start this conversation this morning and I'm going to end it this way. I'm already telling you how I'm going to end it. I'm going to start this conversation this morning and I'm going to end it with this question. You want to write this down too. Where is your energy going? Just write it down. Where is my energy going? Where is my energy going? Because discipline requires energy. And discipline is the bedrock on which human character is built. Period. 
Yes, I mean yesterday. Last week, I shared with you all how to create your life's vision. If you missed that one, I'm gonna tell you something. You missed really a show that teaches you how to create your life. But when I talked to what I talked about in the show was how I've, I've broken vision down into these 12 different categories. And one of those categories is character. Character. And it was difficult for me to go through visioning the character that I want in my life as a man, as a human being, without first, first examining and gaining clarity of where I want to go in disciplining myself and how I discipline myself and how I exhibit self-discipline. Now, this comes later in the show, but I, I just feel led right now as I'm talking about this because this is not a, 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 a very, very, I would say, popular type of topic that discipline is not a cage. However, the lack of discipline, the lack of discipline is the cage that you live in. The lack of discipline is the cage that you live in. If, and if you stick with me, I'm going to tell you what the bars are. The bars that hold you in a cage. I'm going to talk about the bars that hold you in a cage. But many of us live in a cage because we lack discipline. You might be like, Linnell, really? Like, I thought discipline was a cage. No, discipline is intention. Discipline is a combination of your awareness. We're going to come back to this. Your awareness. And by the way, those of you who join me on Mondays for the free coaching webinar, I'm going to give you a, a, a you guys know how I'll give you the free downloads during the webinar. I'm going to give you a download during tomorrow's webinar. You can register if you, if you haven't at linnellharris.com. I'm going to give you a download of these three breakouts. But this is what it looks like. Discipline is a combination of awareness, commitment, and concentration. And in between, like think of those as circles, right? Awareness, commitment, concentration. And in the intersection, awareness and commitment creates a why. You're aware of why you're committed, right? The intersection of commitment and concentration provides consistency. And the intersection of awareness and concentration is where habit lives. We'll talk about that tomorrow, okay? For, at the webinar, we'll dive even deeper into this. But I, I, wanna, I wanna get into discipline like this. I, I want you to think about this. When was the last time, can you remember the last time that you were really, really motivated? Really motivated. I mean, maybe you came out, you watched a YouTube video, you, you, got, you got off the couch like, woo, let's go, right? I mean, maybe you were at a seminar. Maybe you were listening to the show, I don't know. But what did it feel like? Like the last time you were really motivated. Like, what did it feel like? I want you to get present to that feeling. Like, what did it feel like? For me, when I get motivated, motivation feels like a surge of energy. Like a feeling of motivation that creates it. Like it's like endless possibility. Like I get this, I get this surge of energy like that, that kind of gives me a field and a vision of endless possibility. And one of the things about motivation, this is how people have made a living motivating. Motivation can be intoxicating. This is why I don't necessarily call myself a motivational speaker. I'm a teacher. Because I understand that motivation is emotion and it doesn't last. But when it's there, it's, it's intoxicating. And this is, this is the separation between motivation and the things that we want to create. The separation between motivation and the things that you want to create. And between that is the discipline and wisdom that we need to not only enjoy the motivational high, but to use that energizing force to get into action, to create the possibility. Here's, here's a truth. The more organized and disciplined you become in your life, the more freedom you get. 
Let me say it again. The more disciplined and organized you become in your life, the more freedom you experience. The more freedom you experience. We all want to be free, right? So let's, let's talk about the cage. Let's talk about this cage, right? Because many of us, we think discipline is a cage. Discipline is not a cage. See, because if, if I say I want to go here, and in order for me to get here, then I need to take on certain attributes. Those attributes actually allow me to go where I want to go. That's freedom. Think about it. Right. Let's reframe ourselves like that's freedom. The ability for me to say I want to go here and then act accordingly, behave accordingly so I can go where I want to go. That's freedom. Randomness. Lack of organization. Lack of discipline is the cage. Why is it the cage? Because it creates overwhelm. When someone tells me, Linnell, I'm overwhelmed, right away I know, hmm, there's a breakdown of discipline. There's a breakdown in organization. There's a breakdown in clarity. That's how you get it put into a cage. Randomness, let's be clear. Randomness, I talk about living with intention all the time. But when you don't live with intention, you're in a cage. Let's go back to that Louis Vuitton line. And by the way, I'm not just, I mean, ain't nothing wrong with a luxury brand, okay? Let's be clear. But I recall shortly after quarantine, a friend of mine I, I went to school with back in the day what, shot a live video on Facebook. She was in her closet. She was crying. That's what caught my, my attention. I saw her crying, and she was throwing things in her closet. So I tuned in, and she was just talking about how she had been spending money. And now here she was, she lost her job due to quarantine. And she was in her closet. She's like, I have all these things. And one of the things she picked up was a Louis Vuitton bag and she tossed it across the room. She's like, I can't do anything with that. I can't feed my children with that. And she had all this designer, all these designer labels and things that she was just showing in the camera. You know, she was, she put a price tag to it and she would say, you know, I spent $1,700 on this bag. And now somebody, you know, I, I put it online, they just want to give me three. All I can get is $300. She was bawling, she was crying. And she was like, and I gotta, I gotta, I gotta feed my children, I gotta take care of myself, I gotta pay my rent. And she was like, what have I been doing? And she was like, and, she, and, and at the end of her video, she said, mark my word, I will never be here again. Now think about that. My, I, I don't know, I didn't talk to her, but my assertion is that she purchased those things randomly. There was no intention. And her random activity put her in a financial cage. So when the rain fell, she had nowhere to go. Think, it, it, so when we think about I, I, this first hour, I just would really want you to get your mind around this. Discipline, acting with discipline is your freedom. It's your freedom. And, here, and, and randomness is the cage and your excuses, your excuses are the bars to this cage that keep you stuck in your current way of being in your current life. Now think about how crazy that is as human beings. Here I am. I want to be free. But I can't be free because I don't know how to act with intention. I don't know how to pull myself out of the randomness of life. And I'm stuck. But then I create bars that are impenetrable based on my excuses. Well, you don't understand. Well, the reason I did this was that. Or, you know, I can't. Well, you know, I got to have the key. You know, that, that, you know, I can't pass that up. That looks so good. Our excuses become the bars that keep us stuck in the cage of randomness. Now, most of us live beneath the line 
of disciplined action. And what do I mean by that? Most of us live beneath that line. Again, remember, if I'm motivated and I want to go over here to create something, a new possibility, that means that I have to discipline myself to put my energy and action towards that thing. That's my freedom. That's my freedom over there. And what I see over there is my ambition line. I want you to imagine a chart that kind of just goes up like this, right? Just a steep gradient. That's your ambition line. And how you follow your ambition line is disciplined action. How you negate your ability to create is avoidance of the disciplined action. When you think about discipline, I want you to think of discipline as the tool of creation. So I always talk about your creator. Right. Man, you have to know your purpose because you have a piece of God in you and God is a macro creator. You're a micro creator. What are you creating? Most of us, what we created is the cage. The cage of randomness with the bars of excuses. That hold us. That's what we've created. And we and we continue to reinforce the bars every time we give an excuse because you're a creator. You create with your words. I can't do that because of this new bar. Oh, yeah, I can never do that because of this new bar. And then we get frustrated with the cage as it closes in on us. Why can't I do more? Your words, your thinking, your lack of intention has created a cage where you're living in a, in many ways, a, a virtual two by two, four by four cell in life. You know, you want to go somewhere. You can't. You can't. You want to lose weight. You can't. You want to get in a relationship. You can't. You want to make more money, you can't. You want a new job, but you can't. When we come back, how do we begin to develop discipline in a way that breaks us free of the cage, expands our possibility to create the future that we intend to live? That's what we're going to talk about. What is self-discipline when we come back? And how do you create it in your life? You don't want to miss this. You've been listening to Inspirational Perspective. My name is Linnell Harris, your very own life coach. Right here on WBON 1690 AM, the talk of Chicago. Don't change that dial. Resistance wants you to. Don't change it. We'll be right back. All right. Well, let me know what questions you guys have from the first half. Man, 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 man. Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing? Let's have a conversation. Facebook, since we're on break, talk to me. How's this going, man? Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. If you, if you like what you've heard so far, if it makes sense to you, if, 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 you know, it's all coming together, you know, give me some hearts. Let me know I'm in the right place. Let's see what we got here. Let's see what we got here. Pass the it. Talk of Chicago Being a softie is a good thing. 1690 WVON, Berwyn, Chicago. California prepares. All right, man. Once again, thank you guys for the birthday wishes. I, I appreciate you. I really do. All right, let's see what questions we have. The biggest hurdle to my success. The biggest hurdle to my success. Me. Nobody else. Nobody else. All right, let's see what we got going this morning. Nah, Clarence said, don't let some new Nikes come out. Hey, and here's the thing, man. The way we buy, you would think, I mean, be a shareholder. <laughs> be a shareholder. We talking about Nike at dinner last night, man. They, you know, they talking about how that stock's going to run. And it's going to run because we buy it. So, you know, man, if you're going to buy a pair of sneakers, you know, 
I think Nike's at what? 110 right now? That's less than a pair of Jordans. Grab a share, grab a pair. <laughs> Somebody write that down. You know what I'm saying? Grab a share, grab a grab a pair. Like I ain't nothing wrong with buying a shoe, but you know, be an owner too. <laughs> All right, let me see what we got. <clears throat> what we got going? Let me know what questions you guys have so far. You see, I struggle with financial discipline, not in a way that I just want to buy whatever. It just seems like I've always been putting out fires. Maybe that's an excuse. Man, that's, uh, you know what? But, fi you know, financial fires are part of the resistance to, to actually creating what you want to do. And, and by the way, we create these fires. You know, consider that's a part of overwhelm. So what I would say is, like, what do you intend to create in your finances? And then you want to slowly... Like notice how these fires are in some ways eating at the intention and start to get in front of them because they're likely the same fires all the time. Different flavor, but same fires all the time. Start to notice that. <clears throat> we create the cage, that's right. We create the cage. Um, you can't register, you can go to Linnell Harris, it's the webinar. You should be able to register for the webinar. If you can't, let me know. Here, as a matter of fact, let me put a link up tomorrow because tomorrow I'll be sharing the breakout with you guys. I'll be sharing the breakout. Okay, where am I at here? Uh, yep, okay. So here, I'll put this in. Uh, and I'll pin this in the comments so you guys have it. There we go. Hey, let me pin it real quick. Boom, there you go. So that should be right up top. All right, let's see. Uh-oh, uh my video's out. But you guys can hear me, but the video's out. Let's check this out here. Let's see if it comes back now. So by the way, the video is out, guys, because how about this? This is what happens on good stuff. The video is out because the phone went out. I forgot to plug it up. So we'll, we'll be right back in a second here. But if you can still hear me, give me some hearts. That way I know you guys can hear me. I'll reconnect this. Um, ah, there we go. We're back. We're back. Thanks for that, baby. So here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, cool, you guys can hear. Awesome. Happy that happened on break. <laughs> Let's see. All right, cool. Sorry, we're coming back here in a second. And the video should be back. Uh, let's see here. It should be back. Boom. There we go. All right. Well, I'm happy that happened on break. That's a good thing. <laughs> All right, let's go back. Let's see what other questions we have. Are the bars the same as blinders? No, the bars, the, um, the bars are in many ways a little different from blinders because these are your excuses, all right? Your, your excuses are the bars. These are the things that you tell yourself, oh, I can't, I can't, like, and that's, that's, that becomes the bar. So that's, that's, that's how this works. The, the bars aren't blinders. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about next in the next hour is awareness. And what you're not aware of, that's, you know, consider that's part of your blinder, right? That's one of the three aspects of self-discipline is your awareness. So a lot of us, we're not even aware, right? We're not aware that we're hurting in a certain area. And so that hurts us more than anything. So how can I be disciplined in an area of life that I'm not aware of, right? Because my awareness is shut down in that area. 
And so we, I'm, I'll talk a little bit about that and how to develop your awareness because in our culture, there's been a lack of awareness. Um, you know, our awareness is, is, is robbed from us and taken from us and put in different areas. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about how we blame our awareness on different things, right? Oh, I'm not aware because of my cell phone or because of technology, because no, 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 no. Has nothing to do, those are tools. And I, you know, I've asked the question before, are you using your tools or are your tools using you? And so the ability to actually become aware and say, oh, wow, um, I have an addiction to my phone. I'm gonna talk about addiction and how and, how, and what addiction is. But addiction comes from a denial, like some aware, but I deny. And so many of us are aware that we're addicted to our phones, but we deny it. That's, that's how you get addicted. Um, and that's what erodes, that's what erodes your discipline. All right, we're coming back. I see the questions, guys. I'm gonna do my best to, to, to get to them either uh, during the show. And these are some good questions, man. Call in with some of these, 773-591-1690. Um, Cause I see. But Ashley, I like that one. I like that question. I'm going to read that. The short answer is yes. We're back. You're listening to Inspirational Perspective. I'm your host, Linnell Harris, your very own life coach right here on WBON 1690 AM, the talk of Chicago. Today's topic, how to develop your self-discipline. First hour, I made the case for discipline and why discipline is important. We ended with that discipline is not a cage. Your randomness, your lack of intention is the cage. And the bars to that cage are your excuses. So how then, how then do we begin to develop discipline? Well, let's first, let's talk about what is self-discipline. Now, discipline in many ways is creation. Is creation. It's the path to creation. Like intentional creation, not default creation, right? Because in many ways, the cage and the bars are our default creation. So then when we become intentional, that begins to help us create something different. You won't be able to powerfully create in your life unless there's an element of self-discipline. Now, discipline is a character attribute. It's a character attribute. And another way to think about it is a skill. It's a skill. So think about, you know, for those of you that play video games, think about building a character in a video game, right? Like, for instance, you play NBA 2K. You can create a character. You can create a player. And that player will have, you know, the ability to jump so high or the ability to shoot a jump shot or speed. Or, and so you have these different attributes that you can give the character. Well, if you think about yourself as a character that you're building, discipline is one of the attributes that when you think about being successful in life, right? You think about someone being successful on the basketball court, there's certain attributes and characteristics they need to have. Well, when you think about life, there's certain characteristics and attributes that those who are successful have. What is success? Success is not wealth, it's not material things, it's the ability to live a fulfilled life, aligned with your purpose, creating 
and living out that purpose on this planet. Okay? Now, creating and living out your purpose. So now when you think about self-discipline and you think of d- discipline as an attribute or a characteristic, one of the things we have to ask ourselves to start, right? Because again, rem- remember, I-, I talked about these three aspects of discipline. Number one is awareness. So we're going to spend some time in awareness right now. Here's something I want you to write down. Write this question down and think about it. If you calculated your discipline attribute on a scale of one to 10, where would you land? And just think about that. If you calculated your discipline attributes on a scale of one to 10, where would you land? And the reason I want to start here is because the real key to self-discipline is your awareness and your ability to act with moderation. Let's talk about that. See, because the thing is, you know, we often when you you hear people talk about self-discipline, they'll make it incredibly hard. You just got to stop this, stop that. And most people are like, well, you know, how do I stop that? Like, you know, let's be let's be real. Pizza is good. It tastes good. Okay, cake (laughs) is good. It tastes good. Donuts are good. Like, let's not, you know, let's just be real here, okay? These things, they, I mean, they do something to the taste buds. And then, by the way, when you put it in your mouth and it hits your bloodstream, it does something to the body. It's like, mm, right? And so, I mean, these things, it's real. These things are good. So, for somebody just to say, no more cake for the rest of your life. Well, that's not... That's not realistic. And by the way, that's not necessarily what discipline is. Discipline is moderation. So what is moderation? Moderation is knowing when you've had enough. Knowing when you've had enough. Now, moderation takes awareness. And see, this is the thing. Most of us, we're not we're not aware. So what happens is. We're at home. Someone said, I made you a cake for your birthday. We're like, oh, yeah, cake is good. Cake is good. So then, you know, you're like, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. You go, you cut a slice. Pop, pop. And, you know, you look at the slice and you be like, mm, that's big. That's big. All right, let me let me cut that in half. Pop, pop. So you're practicing awareness in that, uh, moderation in that moment. You take, you take the piece of cake off and you start to eat it. You're like, oh, <laughs> this is good. This is wonderful. I love it. Then you go to yourself and you go, hmm, now I did cut myself a bigger piece and I took a smaller piece. So it's okay if I go back and I just take the rest of that piece. And so you make an excuse. What excuses? What excuses? Remember, excuses are the bars to the cage of randomness, right? So you go back, you take that piece. Man, it's my birthday. Why am, I, why am I just cutting one piece of cake? I can have as much cake as I want. Another excuse, new bar. And see, this is, this is how it happens. Moderation is knowing when you had enough. That was a great piece of cake. I enjoyed it. But my intentions and where I want to be in life does not have me eating that whole cake. I mean, I've talked to people. I've talked to people who've ate, like literally have admitted, Linnell, I ate the whole cake. How does that happen? No judgment either. Like no judgment. How does it happen? There was a lack of awareness. When a person was eating the whole cake, they were not aware that they were eating the whole cake. Somewhere along the way, as they let go of moderation, they also let go of their awareness. So when it comes to self-discipline, if if you understand that your awareness and moder and moderation are aligned, like if, if, if you want to be moderate, you have to be aware. And if, and, if, and if you want to be aware, there has to be some practice of moderation. Otherwise, the awareness dissipates. This takes awareness. So ask yourself, do I know how to stop when I've had enough? And then here's the other part of awareness. Where are the areas where I don't know how to stop? Because that's the first part of discipline. Not saying I'm not going to do it, but just being aware that it's difficult for me in this area. 
Let's be clear. This is one of the biggest things I think as human beings we make mistakes with. You're human. As a result of being human, you are flawed. Okay? And because you're flawed, you're going to make mistakes. And guess what? Because you're human and you're flawed and you're going to make mistakes, mistakes are okay. The problem is when you're not aware of the mistake. It's the awareness, right? So if I'm, if I'm clear, I'm intentional, then I look and say, hmm, that was a big piece of cake. I did not intend to have a piece of cake like that. That's, that was a mistake. Now I'm aware. My awareness is back. I can now bring my moderation back. So I'm going to stop. Here's the thing about awareness, folks. Your awareness, where awareness goes, energy flows. Write this down. Where awareness goes, energy flows. Period. Now, let me break this down in other ways, right? When you think about your life, where your awareness goes, your energy flows. Now, you're a creator. So where your energy goes, you create. So, if I'm aware, right, I talked about my life vision last year, last year, last week, okay? Last week, I talked about creating your life's vision. And I said I brought awareness to 12 different aspects of my life. The gift of bringing awareness to 12 different aspects of my life is huge. Because now I'm aware. I'm looking at my finances with awareness, I'm looking at my parenting with awareness. I can go down a list, right? I'm looking at my health and well-being with awareness. This is where I am. This is where I want to be. So now, because I'm aware, I can begin practicing moderation. And moderation is the first step to self-discipline. The first step. If you learn to moderate your behavior, you can then practice discipline with your behavior. You consequently begin to develop discipline in that place. But first, moderation. So here's a question I have for you. What are your weaknesses? Do you know them? Write it down. What are my weaknesses? Do you know your weaknesses? Because the thing about weaknesses and, and Marcus Buckingham does as well. He, he, you know, he helps with strip finding through Gallup. Gallup is an organization, organization. They do lots of research. And one of the things they put out is this assessment called strength, strength finders. So they help you identify your strengths. But one of the things they say is your weaknesses will always be your weaknesses. And Marcus Buckingham, what he talks about in his book is he teaches people to focus on their strengths, not the weaknesses. Because the weaknesses, well, they likely will, will remain weaknesses. That's why they're weaknesses. But am I aware of the weakness? Am I aware? And do I play my game in a way that allows me to place my strength in the areas of weakness? So let, let me give you a personal example, okay? So I'm a, I, I love basketball. Basketball is my game, all right? There are areas in my game where I know my weaknesses. I know my weaknesses. I just know them, right? Um, I don't jump as high as I used to jump. That's, you know, and so I block out <laughs> for rebounds. So I can still grab a lot of rebounds because I know I don't, I can't jump over you, so I'm gonna keep you away, okay? I know the weakness. So as I've gotten older, I see these weaknesses and I'm like, how do I compensate for that? How do I compensate for this weakness? Because I really don't want to jump that high anymore. I'm 44 years old. I don't want to be all the way up there. I want to be, I want to be, I want to know when I'm coming down. Okay. So how do I compensate for the weakness? Do you know your weaknesses? Awareness allows you to moderate your areas of weakness. Okay, this is why awareness in, in terms of the concept of self-discipline is so important. With coaching, as a coach, the first month of coaching, all about awareness. 
Right now, I'm working with a few new clients and I have a brand new group. The group, I think we're in week four or five of coaching. This group, only thing we've been talking about, awareness. What's your cognitive distortion? How do you see the world? What's your context? And, and, this, and, and one of the things they're talking about is like, I'm noticing everything, Linnell. Oh my goodness, great, great. Because as you notice, as you become aware, this is the first step, step to discipline. The first step. The intersection between your awareness and your commitment provides the why. So how do you act with moderation? It's not magic. It's because you have a why. You know why you're not going to go back and have a piece of cake. If you don't have a why, there's no reason. So the other thing is, if I'm aware, now I'm aware of myself and I have goals. Right? This is why I'm such a big component of goals. And I have goals. My awareness plus my goals begins to help me moderate my behavior so I can take intentional action. Now, let me know if this is making sense. Matter of fact, I'm going to go here and look on Facebook. You guys tell me, is this making sense to you? Like what, what I'm saying here? Does this? Because I really want to make sure that you guys are tracking with what I'm saying. So I'm, I just want to see. Somebody asked, do you work on your strengths or your weaknesses? Clarence, you work on your strengths. You become aware of your weaknesses. So you work on the strengths. You develop your strengths. And you practice awareness around your weaknesses. Okay? Let me see. I'm just looking at questions here. Just looking at questions. I want to I want to make sure you guys get this part. So I'm using Facebook to make sure that you get this part. Okay? All right. Let me see. Let me see what somebody just wrote. You guys getting this? You getting this? I'm aware I need to lose. Okay. All right. So you get this. All right. Cool. Somebody said, I'm aware I need to lose weight, but I'm not disciplined enough to do it. All right. So here's the thing. You have awareness. But the awareness has to be, it can't just exist by itself. This is where commitment comes in. So what are you committed to? in terms of and by the way I, I'm not big on making it about weight I'm not big because you know what's weight I mean weight is subjective in many places I mean I weigh almost 200 pounds but I'm healthy I, I, I feel good I feel like I look good right somebody might say well that's too much 200 pounds it's all you know it's all relative but what's your goal around your health and fitness how do you want to feel? How do you want to look? How do you want to be able to behave out in life? And what does that mean in alignment with health and well-being? Once you have that commitment, that gives you a why. That why allows you to act with moderation. All right, cool. It's making sense. All right, cool. I'm going to continue. So here's what happens. Here's what happens. So remember, I was getting on the folks at Louis Vuitton. OK, at the Louis Vuitton store standing in line. And I was like, man, are they all in line for a reward? Here's why. OK, so let's talk about this. So you're aware. Now you have a goal and the goal is your commitment. This gives you a why that allows you to act with moderation. Why act with moderation? Because of the goal. Right. Because I'm aware that something needs to change. Now. When I act with moderation consistently enough to allow me to begin hitting my milestones for the goal, I reward myself. I reward myself. And that's when I go to Louis Vuitton. Right? See, we got it mixed up, man. <laughs> and by the way, I'm not going to Louis Vuitton, but you guys get my point, right? That's when I, re like, I hit the goal. Now I get the reward. We have it the other way around. We like, I worked hard all week. I get to I get to treat myself. I'm going to treat myself with no intention. Well, what's the intention? What are you working for? Are you aware of what you're working for? Where are you in, on the path towards the goal? And based on where you are in the path towards the goal is a reward in order. Because if not, well, you might want to practice moderation. <laughs> All right. This is where I want to talk about the power of personal standards. This is where the power of personal standards is really important in talking about self-discipline, okay? So what do I mean by that? When you look at your life, who is it that you intend to be? And what standard do you wanna set for yourself? Not Linnell's standard, 
not somebody else's standard, not the pastor's standard. I'm across the board. Like, this is another reason I think we struggle because we're trying to put other people's standards on us. No. What are your standards? Do you know your standards for yourself? For me, my standard, I have a standard of physical fitness. I have a standard in terms of what I want to create there. I have a standard of, for my intellectual life in terms of what I want to create in my learning. What I want to create intellectual. I have a standard. Hey, these are the things you want to know. Last night, we were just we were, you know, sitting with family, we were talking. And uh, they were sharing some things that are going on in the news right now. And I'm like, yeah, I had, man, I had no idea. I, I don't really watch the news, right? I don't have a standard. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a, a news anchor, right? So as a result, there's no standard around how much news I need to watch. So I don't watch it. I prefer not to. I think it's depressing, okay? So that's my standard. I don't want to feel depressed. That's a standard. And so the news is depressing, so I don't watch the news. And by the way, my intellectual standard has nothing to do with current events. i much rather pick up a book, right? That's my standard. How much are you learning? What did you learn this month? What did you learn this year, et cetera? My personal standard. I have a standard for my marriage. I want us to operate connected, in love, like passion. Like I have a standard. So when we're not on standard, Right. This is where discipline comes in. My wife can make me mad and I could feel like I'm legitimately angry, angry with her. But then I go to myself, OK. What's the commitment? And based on the commitment, what's my why? Well, this is the woman I'm going to be with. And so maybe I'm just going to back off a bit here. And practice moderation with my anger. Practice moderation with how I speak to her. Practice moderation in terms of how I even begin to think about my own feelings about this. Like I'm upset, but how will I express myself? Because I have a place where I'm looking to go. I have a standard for my marriage. And I don't want to disrupt the standard. So one of the things I believe is, is one of the reasons we have a difficult time with discipline is because we don't even know our personal standards. So this morning, I want you to write this down. What are my personal standards? What are my personal standards in my health? What are my personal standards for a relationship? I think a lot of times, you know, women, you're struggling in relationships or, or in and out of relationships because you don't have standards. You don't have standards. You know, you, you're going out with a guy that doesn't even meet your standards, but you're not aware. Awareness, you're not aware. You're not aware. You're not aware he doesn't meet your standards until you're crying again. I shouldn't even been with him. That's not even the kind of guy I would go out with. Then your awareness kicks in with all the pain. What if you were aware first? You had a goal for the kind of men you wanted to meet. You had personal standards aligned with that. You were very clear about your why. And you practice discipline, even when they were cute. Oh, <laughs> man. So personal standards. Here's the other thing. When you, when you know your weaknesses, right? Again, I'm sticking with the awareness around this. Awareness. When you know your weaknesses, then you can avoid distraction and temptation. You can avoid distraction and temptation. So here's the thing. If I know, if I know that I have a weakness for donuts, then I should say no to getting coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. Well, I'm just going to pick up this coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. You know, it's, you know, I'm not going to get the donut, though. Really? You're playing yourself. See, and this is the thing. One of the things I always like to say is say, say no when no is easy. Well, I really want some coffee. Well, Burger King's right there. I don't like their coffee, so... Stay away from the donut. <laughs> you get where I'm going? Or Starbucks is right there. Or McDonald's is right there. Go there. Stay away from the donut. Say no when no is easy. You avoid, part of, part of the idea of self-discipline is to avoid distraction and temptation. So if I'm eating a certain type of way, 
I don't have the foods I'm not eating in the house. It's a setup, right? And by the way, these are things you all know. My role is just to remind you. That's my role. The easiest way to say no is to say no early. Now, let's talk a little bit more about moderation. I had a client who struggled with video games. They're like, man, I, st I struggle with video games. And uh, I need to give them up. I was like, well, I wouldn't give them up. They're like, really? I'm like, no. That's it. Because when we talk about context, those of you who join me on Mondays, you've learned a lot about context and cognitive distortions. I'm like, it's a setup. It's a setup to, to basically, you're going to cut video games, and then you're going to go a month, two months, and then what happens, most people, they go back in hard, right? Boom. And they like, you know, they come up for air a week later, like, I didn't do anything. All I did, what happened? And they lose all the progress they had. So what I said is, let's practice moderation. So you're aware you spend too much time playing video games. Okay. Why do you want to begin cutting the time, right? We're going to commitment. Remember the three areas, awareness, commitment, and underneath commitment is concentration. I'm going to talk a lot about concentration to end. So awareness, commitment. Why don't you want to play video games? Well, if, and, and stick in for video games, whatever yours is. If it's watching TV late at night, whatever it is, stick that in. So why don't you want to play video games? Well, I want to write a book. I just made that up. I want to write a book. The video games are in inhibiting my ability to write a book. Okay. All right. Well, you like playing games. How much time do you want to allocate to the thing that you like? Because this, we get to enjoy life. Right? How much time do you want to allocate to it? You know, I tell people all the time, most of the things out here that we say are bad aren't bad. It's just that we don't know how to moderate them. Right. They say that drinking a glass of wine can extend your life. But alcoholism can basically cut the years you live. It's moderation. Man, they say that marijuana is a, a, a beautiful, a, a beautiful has a beautiful medicinal properties. Well, but how much are you smoking? Moderation. Right. So or how much are you taking or eating? Well, however you want to do it. I can go down the list. I can go down a list of things that have some kind of positive quality, but the reason why we don't get to take advantage of the positive quality is because of a lack of moderation. So then what do you do? Linnell, I wanna stop playing video games because I wanna write a book. All right, how long do you wanna play video games? And I fill in the blank on these things, right? If it's not video games for you. Well, this client was like, well, I tell you what, if I, if I could play you know, an hour to 90 minutes a day, I, I, I mean, I would be happy. I, I would be happy with that. That I could, you know, play. I, I would feel like I'm, I'm playing something. I'm doing something I enjoy. But then I, I need to take the rest of that time to write the book. All right, great. Set an alarm. It's that simple. Set an alarm. You sit down at the game. Before you sit down at the game, set an alarm. 60 minutes, 90 minutes. Create an intention. Create an intention. And say, okay, I'm going to do the same thing with television. I'm going to watch an hour of TV. Okay. Well, set an alarm. <laughs> Make sure it's an hour. Right? See, the thing is, we tell ourselves things, and we know we're not reliable. Awareness, again. Right? I know I'm not reliable. Right? So what do I do? I set an alarm. I set a reminder. I mean, one of the first things I teach my clients, I pick up my phone, a, a group coaching I did it this past week. Uh, and I, I say, I want to say it now, I want you know, it's come up, I say the name, but hey... You can say, Alexa, you can say all these different things, right? Remind me to, right? We have technology. People say, all oh, technology is the reason. No, it's not. It's how we use it because you can use it to make you better. Self-discipline. So set a reminder. And then notice how you do it. If you put the phone right next to you, hit snooze, and you keep playing, well, the phone can't be next to you anymore. Awareness. Put the phone in another room. Turn it up really loud. When it goes off, it's blaring. It's annoying you. You have to get up. When you get up, here's the thing. When you get up, it gives the mind the opportunity to reset. Oh, wait, I do. I'm up. I, I set the alarm for a reason. I'm supposed to write the book. Why am I writing the book? Right. Again, I'm aware. Why am I writing the book? I'm writing the book because this is aligned with my goal. Let me stop. What I call that is adjustment. Self-discipline is not about perfection. 
It's about adjustment. It's about adjustment. It's about being aware, right? Being aware of what's happening around me and how I'm performing and what I'm doing. And then noticing, like, man, I said I was going to play an hour of video games. The whole night went by. Hmm. Wow. Man, I didn't. I even turned the alarm off. I went to the other room and came right back and sat down. Okay, what do I need to do? You know what? I'm going to get an accountability partner. Hey, um, man, you know, I set my alarm, but I also want you to call me in an hour and make sure I'm not playing this game. Right? You, you adjust. You adjust. Most of us, we say, oh, I'm just too weak. I'm too weak. I can't do it. Excuse. Another bar. Another bar. In the cage of randomness. The idea is progress over perfection. Self-discipline is a lifetime pursuit. Let me be let me be clear. How do I know this? Because I'm in the practice of self-discipline. I am not a self-discipline expert, folks. I'm in I am practicing self-discipline. Because I'm practicing self-discipline and I and I help other people as a coach practice self-discipline, I'm just teaching you the practice. Because there are areas in my life where there's an opportunity for more discipline. And this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm noticing it. I'm like, mm, progress over perfection. I adjust. I adjust. And those adjustments have gotten me here, where I am today. And I believe that continual adjustments I make will get me where I'm looking to go. That's what self-discipline is. Now, let's go to this notion of awareness. See, awareness requires that you know yourself. And see, I talk about this all the time. You got to know yourself. But you got to be real with yourself. Don't lie to yourself. I give a practice to my clients where I have them look in the mirror. And this is a, this is a tough activity. Tough activity. Most of the clients I give this to, they go through a lot of emotions. They go through a lot of emotions, tears. Um, anger, all types of things, sadness. But the reason I give them this activity of looking in the mirror, and by the way, you're looking in the mirror, the first part of it is five minutes, the second part, 10 minutes, the next one is 15. Because most of us don't know ourselves. Now think about that. I, I want you to think about something real quick. What I just said is to spend five minutes with yourself in the mirror. And then the next time, 10 minutes. And how many people, just be honest with yourself when, Ooh, that's a lot. That's too much. I ain't trying to do that. But you are your greatest gift. And if you don't want to be with you, how are you going to create something outside of you? How? How? You don't want to be with you. This is where awareness starts. Know thyself, Socrates. So, if you don't know yourself, a really good practice, get in the mirror. See, because what happens is the reason people get emotional is they begin to see themselves for real. Where they're strong, where they're weak, where they're struggling, the secrets they packed away, the things they told themselves weren't so that are, they begin to see it. But here's the gift in that. The more aware you are of where you, of where you the more aware you are of where you are, the better you can adjust. Because now you're playing a real game. Now you're playing a real game. Another reason why people don't like to get into the mirror is because we aren't taught to concentrate. Now, I want you to think about something here. Concentration. Concentration is the third aspect of self-discipline. And it's a little different from awareness, okay? Because now that I'm aware and I'm committed now I have to be able to give my mind to the pursuit. I have to be able to train my mind to stay locked in on the pursuit. Right? Stephen Kotler, he's a phenomenal author, wrote the book Abundance, um, a few other great books. But he, ta he talks about this as flow. He says that it's flow. That concentration, when you can get into a level of concentration where you have a, a singular train of thought, that's flow. And all types of wonderful creation and energy comes from flow. Now, 
Let me let me tell you about our society real quick. This is a bit of a segue. Our children, even now, they're taught all these different things, right? As a matter of fact, I'll be teaching my son, you know, we're working on numbers and things, and so he's gotten there now, but for a while it was frustrating because I take spoons out the ca- out the out the cabinet drawer drawer, and I put six spoons on the table, and I'll say, All right, man, count the spoons. And he'd be like, one. And he'll jump over two of them. Two, three. And he'll look at me. Ha, 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 daddy. I'm like, no, man, concentrate. Right? So one of the first things we begin to say to young people around us is concentrate. Concentrate. But we don't teach them how to concentrate. What is concentration? Concentration is keeping your thoughts in alignment on one thing for an extended period of time. This is huge for discipline. Now, they teach us accounting. They teach us psychology. They teach us political science. They teach us history, their history. They teach us all these different things, right? Nobody teaches us to concentrate. Think about that. What lesson, what course can you take in college on concentration? But then, Here's the thing. Concentration is the key to almost any successful development. What is concentration? The ability to stay in one area of your mind and thought for an extended period of time. That's concentration. That's concentration. So now, okay, so we're clear. I have... Awareness, right over here, commitment, and concentration. These make up, in many ways, the DNA of self-discipline. So the next question I, wanna, I want you to ask yourself, all right, in, in which of these areas am I weak? And it's okay if it's all of them. Because what I, this is what I firmly believe. As you develop your awareness, you develop your concentration. Let me give you an example of what I mean. This is one of the best examples of awareness I've heard. I heard it from a monk. Um, he's really famous on a uh, big YouTube guy. Um, I'm going to get his name wrong. Uh, I don't even want to disrespect him like that, but he's phenomenal. Don, Don Delip, I believe, is his name. But he's a monk. So he spent uh, over a decade training under one of the last great gurus. Um, and... And basically, one of the things he talks about with awareness is he says, he says, I want you to think of awareness as an orb of light. Okay. And your awareness is really going wherever the orb goes. So let me give you an example of what I mean. My wife is talking to me. All right. And and like, like play this out in your life. Like, think about this. My wife is talking to me. And so the intention is to place the orb of awareness on her, right? She's talking, and that's where I am. Or that's where you should be. If you have relationship issues, first place to look is, am I, is the orb of my awareness on my spouse? Because, it's, you know, it's probably not. You know, probably not. Here's how awareness goes for most of us, right? If it were an orb of light that we could see move around you, it's not like, you know, You know, the awareness goes here and it just stays. What happens is most of us, and we've been trained this, is the awareness goes boom, 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 right? And we're like, oh man, why can't I concentrate? Because awareness provides the path to concentration. So I want you to start thinking of your your own awareness as an orb of light. An orb of light. And how it moves in your life. Because this is the thing. We haven't been trained to concentrate. We've been trained to be distracted. Let me say that again. We haven't been trained to concentrate. We've been trained to be distracted. And so because we've been trained to be distracted... That's the muscle we grow. 
Think about this. Our society has been set up to distract us. The very sign that says don't text and drive has you reading a text. <laughs> okay? Right? And then the very government that says don't text and drive makes it okay to put billboards and flashing lights all around the highway. Right? We've been trained to be distracted. So then when you look down in the car at the phone, police pulls you over, what are you doing? That's illegal. Right? And you feel like it's unreasonable. Well, I was just, just looking down, I mean. And why do you feel it's unreasonable? Because you can just look over at the, you, at the billboard. That's legal. You can just look up at the sign. That's legal. Because we've been trained to be distracted. So what happens when you begin training your mind to concentrate? And again, this is the beginning of a new level of self-discipline. This is the adjustment. What happens between commitment and concentration is consistency. So if you're like, well, Linnell, I can't be consistent. I have a hard time being consistent. Like I can't be consistent with anything. Consider that the reason you're not consistent is because there likely isn't a clear commitment and that clear commitment isn't linked to an area of your life where you're willing to concentrate. Like, concentrate. So I'm committed to going to the gym. My wife and I, we go to the gym. I go to the gym first, I come home, and she leaves as soon as I get in, so that way legend has care, right? But part of the commitment is clear because we're in conversations. We're in conversations about, I mean, there's concentration on the commitment which creates consistency we're in conversations about this then when i get to the gym my mind my thought is towards what it is that i'm doing right that's where my mind is i'm concentrating on my fitness in that moment i'm not a lot of other places i'm concentrating on my fitness i'm concentrating on the reps one two three like concentration right this is where this is where discipline begins to take off. Now think about bringing that to the marriage. But get this, to get this. Ask yourself, what if I brought a different level of commitment and concentration to my finances? What would happen? What would happen? Now, I mean, just think about that. Because most of our major complaint is I don't have enough money. I don't have enough money. Wish I had more money. Okay. Make a commitment. Make a commitment with a dollar sign. Very clear. By the end of 2020, by the end of 2021, I want to be generating X amount of dollars. And then what happens if you bring your awareness and your ability to concentrate on that commitment, that self-discipline? If you bring self-discipline to that area of life, let me tell you something. You're going to hit the goal. You're going to hit the goal. The intersection between awareness and concentration, because we're on concentration now, right, is habit. So let's talk about habits. And this is a great way to end this segment on self-discipline. See, the beautiful thing about forming a habit is once you have a habit, it's a habit. And your awareness is always there. Think about that. Think about that. Think about your habits right now. What are some good habits that you have? Good habits. So one of my good habits is to drink water every morning to get my body flushed, right? I wake up and already my awareness is you need to drink water. What do I do? My constant, this is what con how concentration works, right? Because we think concentration has to be for an extended amount of time. No, concentration is simple. I have a thought. From awareness, you need to drink water. The commitment is to drink water for my health and well-being. Then I concentrate and I just walk to the refrigerator, fill up my canteen, squeeze a lemon. Now, mind you, this is all concentration. I haven't lost focus. I didn't go, oh, what's outside? Look at the bird. Is that a blue jay? Like this is concentration. And this is, 
concentration comes in little small increments, folks. It's not like, you know, we think of concentration like, oh, man, I got to sit, meditate for an hour. I'm concentrating. No. Concentration is I'm aware. And then I move with that singular thought, with that singular thought to take an action and complete the action. So then I don't stop there, right? I squeeze the lemon. Actually, I squeeze the lemon, then I pour the water. Then I put the cap on, concentration, and then I drink it until it's gone. And then when it's gone, I move my mind to a new activity. That's self-discipline, right? Awareness, commitment, concentration, all in one. And what happened is, it's now a habit. So this area where, and by the way, there was a time where I was completely dehydrated, folks. When I was in corporate America, I could start the morning, I could fill up a glass, I could fill up a bottle of water, 20 ounces, sit it down on my desk in my office, work all day. And when I look up, I may have drank a quarter of it. I may have drank a quarter of water. Why? Because there wasn't a commitment. There was no awareness around my hydration and my ability to concentrate on, concentrate on it enough to drink it was incredibly low. So what did I do? I started bringing awareness, commitment, and concentration to drinking water. Over time, it became a habit. Now, I don't even think about it. And this is the beauty of habit, right? When we think about how to develop self-discipline, when I began to create discipline in certain areas, even with my finances, right? Twice a month, I go and I have a time set where I, I evaluate the finances, the bills coming in. Where are we with the budget? Like it's, it's set, right? So now it's a habit. Like I don't even feel right. I don't feel right if I don't do it because it's a habit. I just don't, like I feel off. My wife be like, what's wrong with you? I need to, I need to go look at the bills. I need to look at the books. I, yeah, yeah. You know, what's wrong? Because I, I, got, I got a habit, right? You know, you meet somebody with a habit and they can't take care of the habit, they get a tick. Ah, I got a habit. But why not create good habits that create good ticks, right? If I don't get water, I'm like, ah, I don't feel right, right? I get a tick because I have a good habit that creates good ticks. This is self-discipline, okay? Now, Hopefully that frame worked in terms of really thinking about how we do discipline and how discipline works. We can go through, we can go through example after example. Linnell, well, I don't, you know, uh, let's think of another one. Um, we talked about eating cake. We talked about eating, uh, drinking water. Um, we talked about exercise. Uh, let's talk about work. Hey, I, I want to I wanna be more present at work. How do I make that a habit? Same thing. So what? I, here's what I've done. When I'm not coaching, I work in 50-minute increments. Give myself a 10-minute break on the end. I set a timer. Everything I'm, I'm, everything I'm telling you, everything I'm telling you, I've implemented. So what does the timer do? It brings awareness that I have 50 minutes to complete the task. I know I'm completing the task. That's my commitment. Then I practice concentration throughout. The, the timer sitting there running helps my concentration. Somebody texts me, I look, oh, distraction. Mm. But the timer's running right there with the text. Mm. Now I got 20 minutes left. I have to hit them at the 10 minute break. Boom, concentration back. Adjustment. And it's just a practice. And you keep practicing, you keep practicing, you keep practicing until you make a habit. And habit is really ultimately at the intersection of all self-discipline. Because the more you practice something, the better your ability to make it a habit. So, as we bring the show to a close, I want to ask you a few questions. What's important in your life this morning? Like, what, what do you care about? What are you deeply committed to? And how does this message around self-discipline help you support those areas? 
and write it down. What's important? What's most important to you? What, what, what matters most? Who is it that you intend to be? Then I want you to ask yourself another question. Who is important in your life? See, here's the thing about adjustment. There are times when I get off track. There's times when I get off track. There's times when I let myself down. There's times when I'm not performing the way I intend to perform. But when I get present to what's important in my life, and then I get present to who's important, who I intend to be for my wife, what I want to create for her simply because I love her. I want to see her happy. What I want to create for my son as his father, the man I intend to be for him, he's important in my life. And so when I look back to these areas, this is what creates the motivation we talked about earlier. My motivation starts to go up. Then I use that energy and I flow it right into my awareness. Revisit the commitment so it can ignite my concentration. There is self-discipline. So what's important to you? Who is important? Here's the next big question. Is that where your energy is flowing? The things you just said, the things you just wrote down on that paper, what you just thought about, who you just thought about, is that where your energy is flowing this morning? And it's likely because we live in a world of randomness, it may not be, and that's okay. Because today's topic was about awareness. And if you're aware, if you're coming out of this conversation more aware than you were, you've taken the first step of self-discipline, the first step. And so from there, I just want you to, in many ways, use that as the very first anchor to say, I got this, I got this. Hey, I, you know, I might not be that happy with, you know, where I am and Linnell just asked the question about what's important in my life. He just asked me who's important in my life. He just told me that, you know, where my, where my energy goes, my energy flows. And he asked me, where's my energy flowing? And I'm not, I'm not really happy with the answer right now. Awesome. That's the first step to awareness. This morning, if you've, you've been living an intentional life, man, I hope this is a phenomenal reminder for you of how powerful a life like that can be. But more than anything, my wish for all of you, don't get trapped in the cage of randomness. Stop creating the bars with the excuses. And let's all start living a life that we can be proud of, living a life that is intentional towards what it is we intend to create aligned with God's purpose for our lives. You've been listening to Inspirational Perspective. My name is Linnell Harris. I'm your host and life coach. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate you. Once again, thank you for the birthday wishes. And as always, be safe, be blessed, and have a phenomenal week. All right, you guys. That's the show, man. If you got something out of this, I'm going to ask you to share it. Um, share it. You want to give me something for my birthday? Help me advance my purpose. Help me advance the impact that we can have on this community, on our community, so we can move forward powerfully and create the way we, we should be created. But we are some powerful creators, powerful innovators. I believe that we start in to California, storms in the practice self discipline. We can, man. We can do things we never imagined we can do. God bless you guys. Have a good one. I appreciate you.